One of the worst fallacies in the field of economics, propagated by Karl Marx and accepted by almost everyone today, including many businessmen, is the notion that the development of monopolies is an inescapable and intrinsic result of the operation of a free, unregulated economy. In fact, the exact opposite is true. It is a free market that makes monopolies impossible. It is imperative that we be clear and specific in our definition of monopoly. When people speak in an economic or political context of the dangers and evils of monopoly, what they mean, quite clearly, is a coercive monopoly. That is, exclusive control of a given field of production which is closed to and exempt from competition so that those controlling the field are able to set arbitrary production policies and charge arbitrary prices independent of the market, immune from the law of supply and demand. Such a monopoly, it is important to note, entails more than the absence of competition. It entails the impossibility of competition. That is a coercive monopoly's characteristic attribute, which is essential to any condemnation of such a monopoly. In the entire history of capitalism, no one has been able to establish a coercive monopoly by means of competition on a free market. There is only one way to forbid entry into a given field of production, by law. Every coercive monopoly that exists or has ever existed in the United States, in Europe, or anywhere else in the world was created and made possible only by an act of government, by special franchises, licenses, subsidies, by legislative actions which granted special privileges not obtainable on a free market to a man or a group of men and forbade all others to enter that particular field. A coercive monopoly is not the result of laissez-faire. It can result only from the abrogation of laissez-faire and from the introduction of the opposite principle, the principle of statism. In this country, a utility company is a coercive monopoly. The government grants it a franchise for an exclusive territory, and no one else is allowed to engage in that service in that territory. A would-be competitor attempting to sell electric power would be stopped by law. A telephone company is a coercive monopoly. As recently as World War II, the government ordered the two then existing telegraph companies, Western Union and Postal Telegraph, to merge into one monopoly. In the comparatively free days of American capitalism, in the late 19th, early 20th century, there were many attempts to corner the market on various commodities, such as cotton and wheat, to mention two famous examples, then close the field to competition and gather huge profits by selling at exorbitant prices. All such attempts failed. The men who tried it were compelled to give up or else go bankrupt. They were defeated not by legislative action, but by the action of the free market. The question is often asked, what if a large, rich company kept buying out its smaller competitors or kept forcing them out of business by means of undercutting prices and selling at a loss? Would it not be able to gain control of a given field and then start charging high prices and be free to stagnate with no fear of competition? The answer is, no, it could not be done. If a company assumed heavy losses in order to drive out competitors, then began to charge high prices to regain what it had lost, this would necessarily serve as an incentive for new competitors to enter the field, 
and take advantage of the high profitability without any losses to recoup. The new competitors would force prices down to the market level. The large company would have to abandon its attempt to establish monopoly prices or go bankrupt, fighting off the competitors that its own policies would attract. It is a matter of historical fact that no price war has ever succeeded in establishing a monopoly or in maintaining prices above the market level outside the law of supply and demand. Price wars have, however, acted as spurs to the economic efficiency of competing companies and have thereby resulted in enormous benefits to the public in terms of better products at lower prices. In considering this issue, people frequently ignore the crucial role of the capital market in a free economy. As Alan Greenspan observes in his article, Antitrust, which appears in Ayn Rand's book, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, as Mr. Greenspan observes, if entry into a given field of production is not impeded by government regulations, franchises, or subsidies, then, quoting Mr. Greenspan, quote, the ultimate regulator of the competition in a free economy is the capital market. So long as capital is free to flow, it will tend to seek those areas which offer the maximum rate of return, unquote. Investors are constantly seeking the most profitable uses of their capital. If, therefore, some field of production is seen to be highly profitable, particularly when the profitability is due to high prices rather than to low costs, businessmen and investors necessarily will be attracted to that field. And, as the supply of the product in question is increased, relative to the demand for it, prices fall accordingly. Again, quoting Mr. Greenspan, quote, the capital market acts as a regulator of prices, not necessarily of profits. It leaves an individual producer free to earn as much as he can by lowering his costs and by increasing his efficiency relative to others. Thus, it constitutes the mechanism that generates greater incentives to increase productivity and leads, as a consequence, to a rising standard of living." Close quote. The free market does not permit inefficiency or stagnation with economic impunity in any field of production. Consider, for instance, a well-known incident in the history of the American automobile industry. There was a period when Henry Ford's Model T held an enormous part of the automobile market. But when Ford's company attempted to stagnate and to resist stylistic changes, you have doubtless all heard the famous slogan attributed to Ford, you can have any color of the Model T you want so long as it's black. General Motors, with its more attractively styled Chevrolet, cut into a major segment of Ford's market, and the Ford company was compelled to change its policies in order to compete. One will find examples of this principle in the history of virtually every industry. Now, if one considers the only kind of monopoly that can exist under capitalism, a non-coercive monopoly, one will see that its prices and production policies are not independent of the wider market in which it operates, but are fully bound by the law of supply and demand. That there is no particular reason for or value in retaining the designation of monopoly when one uses it in the non-coercive sense, and that there are no rational grounds on which to condemn such monopolies, in quotes. For instance, if a small town has only one drugstore, which is barely able to survive, the owner might be described as enjoying a monopoly, except, of course, that no one would think of using the term in this context. 
There is no economic need or market for a second drugstore. There is not enough trade to support it. But if that town grew, its one drugstore would have no way, no power, to prevent other drugstores from being opened. It is often thought that the field of mining is particularly vulnerable to the establishment of monopolies, since the materials extracted from the earth exist in limited quantity, and since it is believed, some firm might gain control of all the sources of some raw material. But observe, for example, that International Nickel of Canada produces more than two-thirds of the world's nickel, yet it does not charge monopoly prices. It prices its product as though it had a great many competitors. And the truth is that it does have a great many competitors. Nickel, in the form of alloy and stainless steels, is competing with aluminum and a variety of other materials. The seldom recognized principle involved in such cases is that no single product commodity or material is or can be indispensable to an economy regardless of price. A commodity can be only relatively preferable to other commodities. For example, when the price of bituminous coal rose, which incidentally was due to John L. Lewis forcing an economically unjustified wage raise, this was instrumental in bringing about a large-scale conversion to the use of oil and gas in many industries. The free market is its own protector. Now, if a company were able to gain and hold a non-coercive monopoly, if it were able to win all the customers in a given field, not by special government-granted privileges, but by sheer productive efficiency, by its ability to keep its costs low and or to offer a better product than any competitor could, there would be no grounds on which to condemn such a monopoly. On the contrary, the company that achieved it would deserve the highest praise and esteem. No one can morally claim the right to compete in a given field if he cannot match the productive efficiency of those with whom he hopes to compete. There is no reason why people should buy inferior products at higher prices in order to maintain less efficient companies in business. Under capitalism, any man or company that can surpass competitors is free to do so. It is in this manner that the free market rewards ability and works for the benefit of everyone, except those who seek the undeserved. A bromide commonly cited in this connection by capitalism's opponents is the story of the old corner grocer who was driven out of business by the big chain store. What is the clear implication of their protest when they cite this sort of example. It is that the people who live in the neighborhood of the old grocer have to continue buying from him even though a chain store could give them better service at lower prices and thereby let them save money. Thus, both the owners of the chain store and the people in the neighborhood are to be penalized in order to protect the stagnation of the old grocer. By what right? If that grocer is unable to compete with the chain store, then properly he has no choice but to move elsewhere or go into another line of business or perhaps seek employment from the chain store. Capitalism by its nature entails a constant process of motion, of growth, of progress. No one has a vested right to a position if others can do better than he can. When people denounce the free market as cruel, the fact they are decrying is that the market is ruled by a single moral principle.
justice. And that is the root of their hatred for capitalism. There is only one kind of monopoly that men may rightfully condemn, the only kind for which the designation of monopoly is economically significant, a coercive monopoly. Observe that in the non-coercive meaning of the term, every man may be described as a monopolist, since he is the exclusive owner of his effort and product. But this is not regarded as evil, except, of course, by socialists. In the issue of monopolies, as in so many other issues, capitalism is commonly blamed for the evils perpetrated by its destroyers. It is not free trade on a free market that creates coercive monopolies, but government legislation, government action, government controls. If men are concerned about the evils of monopolies, let them identify the actual villain in the picture and the actual cause of the evils, government intervention into the economy. Let them recognize that there is only one way to destroy monopolies, by the separation of state and economics, that is, by instituting the principle that the government may not abridge the freedom of production and trade. One of the most widespread delusions of our age is the belief that the American worker owes his high standard of living to unions and to humanitarian labor legislation. This belief is contradicted by the most fundamental facts and principles of economics, facts and principles which are systematically evaded by labor leaders, legislators, and intellectuals of the statist persuasion. A country standard of living including the wages of its workers, depends on the productivity of labor. High productivity depends on machines, inventions, and capital investment, which depend on the creative ingenuity of individual men, which requires, for its exercise, a politico-economic system that protects the individual's rights and freedom. The productive value of physical labor as such is low. If the worker of today produces more than the worker of 50 years ago, it is not because the former exerts more physical effort. Quite the contrary. The physical effort required of him is far less. The productive value of his effort has been multiplied many times by the tools and machines with which he works. They are crucial in determining the economic worth of his services. To illustrate this principle, consider what would be a man's economic reward on the desert island for pushing his finger the distance of half an inch. Then consider the wages paid for pushing a button to an elevator operator in New York City. It is not muscles that make the difference. As the distinguished economist Professor Ludwig von Mises observes in his book entitled Planning for Freedom, quote, American wages are higher than wages in other countries because the capital invested per head of the worker is greater and the plants are thereby in the position to use the most efficient tools and machines. What is called the American way of life is the result of the fact that the United States has put fewer obstacles in the way of saving and capital accumulation than other nations. The economic backwardness of such countries as India consists precisely in the fact that their policies hinder both the accumulation of capital and the investment of foreign capital. As the capital required is lacking, 
the Indian enterprises are prevented from employing sufficient quantities of modern equipment and therefore producing much less per man hour and can only afford to pay wage rates which compared with American wage rates appear as shockingly low. Close quote. In a free market economy, employers must bid competitively for the services of workers just as they must bid competitively for all the other factors of production. If an employer attempts to pay wages which are lower than his workers can obtain elsewhere, he will lose his workers and thus will be compelled to change his policy or go out of business. If, other things being equal, an employer pays wages which are above the market level, his higher costs will put him at a competitive disadvantage in the sale of his products, and again he will be compelled to change his policy or go out of business. Employers do not lower wages because they are cruel, nor raise wages because they are kind. Wages are not determined by the employer's whim. Wages are the prices paid for human labor, and like all other prices in a free economy, are determined by the law of supply and demand. Since the start of the Industrial Revolution and capitalism, wage rates have risen steadily. As an inevitable economic consequence of rising capital accumulation, technological progress, and industrial expansion. As capitalism created countless new markets, so it created an ever widening market for labor. It multiplied the number and kinds of jobs available, increased the demand and competition for the worker services and thus drove wage rates upward. It was the economic self-interest of employers that led them to raise wages and shorten working hours, not the pressure of labor unions. The eight-hour day was established in most American industries long before unions acquired any significant size or economic power. At a time when his competitors were paying their workers between two and three dollars a day, Henry Ford offered five dollars a day, thereby attracting the most efficient labor force in the country and thus raising his own production and profits. In the 1920s, when the labor movement in France and Germany was far more dominant than in the United States, the standard of living of the American worker was greatly superior. It was the consequence of economic freedom. Needless to say, men have a right to organize into unions, provided they do so voluntarily, that is, provided no one is forced to join. Unions can have value as fraternal organizations, or as a means of keeping members informed of current market conditions, or as a means of bargaining more effectively with employers, particularly in small, isolated communities. It may happen that an individual employer is paying wages that, in the overall market context, are too low. In such a case, a strike, or the threat of a strike, can compel him to change his policy since he will discover that he cannot obtain an adequate labor force at the wages he offers. However, the belief that unions can cause a general rise in the standard of living is a myth. Today, the labor market is no longer free. Far from it. Unions enjoy a unique, near-monopolistic power over many aspects of the economy. This has been achieved through legislation which has forced men to join unions whether they wish to or not, and forced employers to deal with these unions whether they wish to or not. As a consequence, 
wage rates in many industries are no longer determined by a free market. Unions have been able to force wages substantially above their normal market level. These are the alleged social gains for which unions are usually given credit. In fact, however, the result of their policy has been a. a curtailment of production, b. widespread unemployment, and c. the penalizing of workers in other industries as well as the rest of the population. Let us consider these points. a. with the rise of wage rates to inordinately high levels, production costs are such that cutbacks in production are often necessary, new undertakings become too expensive, and growth is hindered. At the increased costs, marginal producers, that is, those who have been barely able to compete in the market, find themselves unable to remain in business. The overall result? Goods and services that would have been produced are not brought into existence. B. As a result of the high wage rates, employers can afford to hire fewer workers. As a result of curtailed production, employers need fewer workers. Thus, one group of workers obtains unjustifiably high wages at the expense of other workers who are unable to find jobs at all. This, in conjunction with minimum wage laws, is the cause of widespread unemployment. Unemployment is the inevitable result of forcing wage rates above their free market level. In a free economy in which neither employers nor workers are subject to coercion, wage rates always tend toward the level at which all those who seek employment will be able to obtain it. In a frozen, controlled economy, this process is blocked. As a result of allegedly pro-labor legislation and of the monopolistic power that labor unions enjoy, unemployed workers are not free to compete in the labor market by offering their services for less than the prevailing wage rates. Employers are not free to hire them. In the case of strikes, if unemployed workers attempted to obtain the jobs vacated by union strikers by offering to work for a lower wage, they often would be subjected to threats and physical violence at the hands of union members, with legal immunity for the union members, incidentally. These facts are as notorious as they are evaded in most current discussions of the unemployment problem evaded particularly by government officials. C. When market conditions are such that producers whose labor costs have risen cannot raise the prices of the goods they sell, a curtailment of production results, as I have already indicated, and the general population accordingly suffers a loss of potential goods and services. Parenthetically, the notion that producers can absorb such wage increases by taking them out of profits without a detriment to future production, this notion is worse than economically naive. It is profits that make future production possible. The amount of profits that go not into investment but into the producer's personal consumption is negligible in the overall economic context. To the extent that market conditions do allow, producers whose labor costs have risen are obliged to raise the prices of their goods. Then workers in other industries find that their living costs have gone up, that they must now pay higher prices for the goods they purchase. Then they, in turn, demand a raise in their industries which leads to new price rises, which leads to new wage increases, etc.
Union leaders typically express indignation whenever prices are raised. The only prices they consider it moral to raise are the prices paid for labor, that is, wages. Non-unionized workers and the rest of the population generally face the same steady rise in their living costs. They are made to subsidize the unjustifiably high wages of union workers, and they are the unacknowledged victims of the union's social gains. And one observes the spectacle of bricklayers receiving two or even three times the salary of office workers and professors. It cannot be sufficiently emphasized that it is not unionism as such, but government controls and regulations which make this state of affairs possible. In a free, unregulated economy, in a market from which coercion is barred, no economic group can acquire the power so to victimize the rest of the population. The solution does not lie in new legislation directed against unions, but in the repeal of the legislation that made the present evil possible. The inability of unions to achieve real, widespread raises in wage rates, to raise the standard of living generally, is in part obscured by the phenomenon of inflation. As a consequence of the government's policy of deficit spending and credit expansion, the purchasing power of the monetary unit, the dollar, has diminished drastically across the years. Nominal wage rates have increased considerably more than real wage rates, that is, wages measured in terms of actual purchasing power. What has further served to obscure this issue is the fact that real wage rates have risen considerably since the start of the century. In spite of destructive and increasing governmental restraints on the freedom of production and trade, major advances in science, technology, and capital accumulation have been made and have raised the general standard of living. It should be added that these advances are less than would have occurred in a fully free economy, and as controls continue to tighten, such advances become slower and rarer. It is relevant to consider against what obstacles businessmen have had to fight and to go on producing. It is very relevant to remember this when one hears labor leaders proclaiming in indignant tones the workers' right to a larger share of the national product. To paraphrase John Galt, a larger share provided by whom? Blank out. Economic progress, like every other form of progress, has only one ultimate source, man's mind, and can exist only to the extent that man is free to translate his thought into action. Let anyone who believes that a high standard of living is the achievement of labor unions and government controls, ask himself the following question. If one had a time machine and transported the United Labor Chieftains of America plus three million government bureaucrats back into the 10th century, would they be able to provide the medieval serf with electric light, refrigerators, automobiles, and television sets. When one grasps that they would not, one should identify who and what makes these things possible. It is characteristic of the enemies of capitalism that they denounce it for evils which are in fact the result not of capitalism but of statism, evils which result from and are made possible only by government intervention in the economy. I have discussed a flagrant example of this policy, 
the charge that capitalism leads to the establishment of coercive monopolies. The most notorious instance of this policy is the claim that capitalism, by its nature, inevitably leads to periodic depressions. Statists repeatedly assert that depressions, the phenomenon of the so-called business cycle of boom and bust, are inherent in laissez-faire, and that the great crash of 1929 was the final proof of the failure of an unregulated free market economy. What is the truth of the matter? A depression is a large-scale decline in production and trade. It is characterized by a sharp drop in productive output, in investment, in employment, and in the value of capital assets, plants, machinery, etc. Normal business fluctuations or a temporary decline in the rate of industrial expansion do not constitute a depression. A depression is a nationwide contraction of business activity and a general decline in the value of capital assets of major proportions. There is nothing in the nature of a free market economy to cause such an event. The popular explanations of depression as caused by overproduction, underconsumption, monopolies, labor-saving devices, maldistribution, excessive accumulations of wealth, etc., have been exploded as fallacies many times. See in this connection Carl Snyder's excellent book, Capitalism the Creator, published by the Macmillan Company in 1940. Readjustments of economic activity, shifts of capital and labor from one industry to another due to changing conditions, occur constantly under capitalism. This is entailed in the process of motion, growth, and progress that characterizes capitalism. But there always exists the possibility of profitable endeavor in one field or another, there is always the need and demand for goods, and all that can change is the kind of goods it becomes most profitable to produce. In any one industry, it is possible for supply to exceed demand in the context of all the other existing demands. In such a case, there is a drop in prices, in profitableness, in investment, and in employment in that particular industry. Capital and labor tend to flow elsewhere, seeking more rewarding uses. Such an industry undergoes a period of stagnation as a result of unjustified, that is, uneconomic, unprofitable, unproductive investment. In a free economy that functions on a gold standard, such unproductive investment is severely limited. Unjustified speculation does not rise unchecked until it engulfs an entire nation. In a free economy, the supply of money and credit needed to finance business ventures is determined by objective economic factors. It is the banking system that acts as the guardian of economic stability. The principles governing money supply operate to forbid large-scale, unjustified investment. Most businesses finance their undertakings, at least in part, by means of bank loans. Banks function as an investment clearinghouse, investing the savings of their customers in those enterprises which promise to be most successful. Banks do not have unlimited funds to loan. They are limited in the credit they can extend by the amount of their gold reserves. In order to remain successful, to make profits and thus attract the savings of investors, banks must make their loans judiciously. They must seek out those ventures which they judge to be most sound and potentially profitable.
if, in a period of increasing speculation, banks are confronted with an inordinate number of requests for loans, then, in response to the shrinking availability of money, they A, raise their interest rates, and B, scrutinize more severely the ventures for which loans are requested, setting more exacting standards of what constitutes a justifiable investment. As a consequence, funds are more difficult to obtain, and there is a temporary curtailment and contraction of business investment. Businessmen are often unable to borrow the funds they desire and have to reduce plans for expansion. The purchase of common stocks, which reflects the investors' estimates of the future earnings of companies, is similarly curtailed. Overvalued stocks fall in price. Businesses engaged in uneconomic ventures now unable to obtain additional credit, are obliged to close their doors. A further waste of productive factors is stopped and economic errors are liquidated. At worst, the economy may experience a mild recession, that is, a slight general decline in investment and production. In an unregulated economy, readjustments occur quite swiftly and then production and investment begin to rise again. The temporary recession is not harmful but beneficial. It represents an economic system in the process of correcting its errors, of curtailing disease and returning to health. The impact of such a recession may be significantly felt in a few industries, but it does not wreck an entire economy. A nationwide depression such as occurred in the United States in the 30s would not have been possible in a fully free society. It was made possible only by government intervention in the economy, more specifically by government manipulation of the money supply. The government's policy consisted in essence of anesthetizing the regulators inherent in a free banking system that prevent runaway speculation and consequent economic collapse. All government intervention in the economy is based on the belief that economic laws need not operate, that principles of cause and effect can be suspended, that everything in existence is flexible and malleable except a bureaucrat's whim which is omnipotent. Reality, logic, and economics must not be allowed to get in the way. This was the implicit premise that led to the establishment in 1913 of the Federal Reserve System, an institution with control through complex and often indirect means over the individual banks throughout the country. The Federal Reserve undertook to free individual banks from the limitations imposed on them by the amount of their own individual reserves, to free them from the laws of the market, and to arrogate to government officials the right to decide how much credit they wish to make available at what times. A cheap money policy was the guiding idea and goal of these officials. Banks were no longer to be limited in making loans by the amount of their gold reserves. Interest rates were no longer to rise in response to increasing speculation and increasing demand for funds. Credit was to remain readily available until and unless the Federal Reserve decided otherwise. The government argued that by taking control of money and credit out of the hands of private bankers and by contracting or expanding credit at will, guided by considerations other than those influencing the selfish bankers, it could, in conjunction with other interventionist policies, so control investment as to guarantee a state of virtually constant prosperity. Many bureaucrats believed that the government could keep the economy in a state of unending boom. 
to borrow an invaluable metaphor from my colleague Alan Greenspan, if under laissez-faire the banking system and the principles controlling the availability of funds act as a fuse that prevents a blowout in the economy, then the government through the Federal Reserve System put a penny in the fuse box. The result was the explosion known as the crash of 1929. Throughout most of the 1920s, the government compelled banks to keep interest rates artificially and uneconomically low. As a consequence, money was poured into every sort of speculative venture. By 1928, the warning signals of danger were clearly apparent. Unjustified investment was rampant, and stocks were increasingly overvalued. The government chose to ignore those danger signals. A free banking system would have been compelled by economic necessity to put the brakes on this process of runaway speculation. Credit and investment in such a case would be drastically curtailed. The banks which made unprofitable investments, the enterprises which proved unproductive, and those who dealt with them would suffer. But that would be all. The country as a whole would not be dragged down. However, the alleged anarchy of a free banking system had been abandoned in favor of enlightened government planning. The boom and the wild speculation which had preceded every major depression were allowed to rise unchecked involving in a widening network of malinvestments and miscalculations the entire economic structure of the nation. People were investing in virtually everything and making fortunes overnight, on paper. Profits were calculated on hysterically exaggerated appraisals of the future earnings of companies. Credit was extended with promiscuous abandon on the premise that somehow the goods would be there to back it up. It was like the policy of a man who passes out rubber checks, counting on the hope that he will somehow find a way to obtain the necessary money and to deposit it in the bank before anyone presents his checks for collection. But A is A and reality is not infinitely elastic. In 1929, the country's economic and financial structure had become impossibly precarious. By the time the government finally and frantically raised the interest rates, it was too late. It is doubtful whether anyone can state with certainty what events first set off the panic, and it does not matter. The crash had become inevitable. Any number of events could have pulled the trigger. But when the news of the first bank and commercial failures began to spread, uncertainty swept across the country in widening waves of terror. People began to sell their stocks, hoping to get out of the market with their gains or to obtain the money they suddenly needed to pay bank loans that were being called in. And other people seeing this apprehensively began to sell their stocks. And virtually overnight, an avalanche hurled the stock market downward. Prices collapsed. Securities became worthless. Loans were called in, many of which could not be paid. The value of capital assets plummeted sickeningly. Fortunes were wiped out. And by 1932, business activity had come almost to a halt. The law of causality had avenged itself. Such, in essence, was the nature and cause of the 1929 Depression. It provides one of the most eloquent illustrations of the disastrous consequences of a planned economy. In a free economy, When an individual businessman makes an error of economic judgment, he, 
and perhaps those who immediately deal with him suffer the consequences. In a controlled economy, when a central planner makes an error of economic judgment, the whole country suffers the consequences. But it was not the Federal Reserve, it was not government intervention that took the blame for the 1929 Depression, it was capitalism. Freedom, cried statists of every breed and sect, had had its chance and had failed. The voices of the few thinkers who pointed to the real cause of the evil were drowned out in the denunciations of businessmen, of the profit motive of capitalism. Had men chosen to understand the cause of the crash, the country would have been spared much of the agony that followed. The Depression was prolonged for tragically unnecessary years by the same evil that had caused it, namely government controls and regulations. Contrary to popular misconception, Controls and regulations began long before the New Deal. In the 1920s, the mixed economy was already an established fact of American life. But the trend toward statism began to move faster under the Hoover administration. And with the advent of Roosevelt's New Deal, it accelerated at an unprecedented rate. The economic adjustments needed to bring the Depression to an end were prevented from taking place. By the imposition of strangling controls, increased taxes, and labor legislation. This last had the effect of forcing wage rates to unjustifiably high levels, thus raising the businessman's costs at precisely the time when costs needed to be lowered if investment and production were to revive. The National Industrial Recovery Act, the Wagner Act, and the abandonment of the gold standard with the government's subsequent plunge into inflation and an orgy of deficit spending were only three of the many disastrous measures enacted by the New Deal for the avowed purpose of pulling the country out of the Depression. All had the opposite effect. Further, the obstacle to business recovery did not consist exclusively of the specific New Deal legislation passed. More harmful still was the general atmosphere of uncertainty engendered by the administration. Men had no way to know what law or regulation would descend on their heads at any moment. They had no way to know what sudden shifts of direction government policy might take. They had no way to plan long range. To act and produce, businessmen require knowledge, the possibility of rational calculation, not faith and hope. Above all, not faith and hope concerning the unpredictable twistings within a bureaucrat's head. Such advances as business was able to achieve under the New Deal collapsed in 1937 as a result of an intensification of uncertainty regarding what the government might choose to do next. Unemployment rose to more than 10 million, and business activity fell almost to the low point of 1932, the worst year of the Depression. It is part of the official New Deal mythology that Roosevelt got us out of the Depression. How was the problem of the Depression finally solved? By the favorite expedient of all statists in times of emergency, a war. The depression precipitated by the stock market crash of 1929 was not the first in American history, though it was incomparably more severe than any that had preceded it. If one studies the earlier depressions, the same basic cause and common denominator will be found. In one form or another, by one means or another, government manipulation of the money supply 
It is typical of the manner in which interventionism grows that the Federal Reserve System was instituted as a proposed antidote against those earlier depressions, which were themselves products of monetary manipulation by the government. The financial mechanism of an economy is the sensitive center, the living heart of business activity. In no other area can government intervention produce quite such disastrous consequences. For a general discussion of the business cycle and its relation to government manipulation of the money supply, see Ludwig von Mises' treatise, Human Action. One of the most striking facts of history is men's failure to learn from it. For further details, see the policies of the present administration. Among the questions commonly asked by students of objectivist political theory is the following. Should education be compulsory and tax supported as it is today? The answer to this question becomes evident if one makes the question more concrete and specific as follows. Should the government be permitted to remove children forcibly from their homes with or without the parents' consent and subject the children to educational training and procedures of which the parents may or may not approve? Should citizens have their wealth expropriated to support an educational system which they may or may not sanction and to pay for the education of children who are not their own. To anyone who understands and is consistently committed to the principle of individual rights, the answer is clearly no. There are no moral grounds whatever for the claim that education is the prerogative of the state, or for the claim that it is proper to expropriate the wealth of some men for the unearned benefit of others. The doctrine that education should be controlled by the state is consistent with the Nazi or communist theory of government. It is not consistent with the American theory of government. The totalitarian implications of state education, preposterously described as free education, have in part been obscured by the fact that in America, unlike Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia, private schools are legally tolerated. Such schools, however, exist not by right, but only by permission. Further, the facts remain that a. most parents are effectively compelled to send their children to state schools since they are taxed to support these schools and cannot afford to pay the additional fees required to send their children to private schools. B. The standards of education controlling all schools are prescribed by the state. And C. The growing trend in American education is for the government to exert wider and wider control over every aspect of education. As an example of this last when many parents who objected to the pictographic method of teaching school children to read undertook to teach their children at home by the phonetic method, a proposal was made legally to forbid parents to do so. What is the implication of this if not that the child's mind belongs to the state? When the state assumes financial control of education, it is logically appropriate that the state should progressively assume control of the content of education, since the state has the responsibility of judging whether or not its funds are being used satisfactorily. But when a government enters the sphere of ideas, when it presumes to prescribe in issues concerning intellectual content, that is the death of a free society. To quote Isabel Patterson, 
from her book, The God of the Machine, quote, Educational texts are necessarily selective in subject matter, language, and point of view. Where teaching is conducted by private schools, there will be a considerable variation in different schools. The parents must judge what they want their children taught by the curriculum offered. And then each must strive for objective truth. Nowhere will there be any inducement to teach the supremacy of the state as a compulsory philosophy. But every politically controlled educational system will inculcate the doctrine of state supremacy sooner or later, whether as the divine right of kings or the will of the people in democracy. Once that doctrine has been accepted, it becomes an almost superhuman task to break the stranglehold of the political power over the life of the citizen. It has had his body, property, and mind in its clutches from infancy. Unquote. The disgracefully low level of education in America today is the predictable result of a state-controlled school system. Schooling, to a marked extent, has become a status symbol and a ritual. More and more people are entering college, and fewer and fewer people are emerging properly educated. Our educational system is like a vast bureaucracy, a vast civil service, in which the trend is toward a policy of considering everything about a teacher's qualifications, such as the number of his publications, except his teaching ability and of considering everything about a student's qualifications, such as his social adaptability, except his intellectual competence. The solution is to bring the field of education into the marketplace. There is an urgent economic need for education. When educational institutions have to compete with one another in the quality of the training they offer, when they have to compete for the value that will be attached to the diplomas they issue, educational standards will necessarily rise. When they have to compete for the services of the best teachers, the teachers who will attract the greatest number of students, then the caliber of teaching and of teacher salaries will necessarily rise. Today, the most talented teachers often abandon their profession and enter private industry, where they know their efforts will be better rewarded. When the economic principles that have resulted in the superlative efficiency of American industry are permitted to operate in the field of education, the result will be a revolution in the direction of unprecedented educational development and growth. Education should be liberated from the control or intervention of government and turned over to profit-making private enterprise, not because education is unimportant, but because education is so crucially important. What must be challenged is the prevalent belief that education is some sort of natural right, in effect, a free gift of nature. There are no such free gifts. But it is in the interests of statism to foster this delusion in order to throw a smokescreen over the issue of whose freedom must be sacrificed to pay for such allegedly free gifts. As a result of the fact that education has been tax-supported for such a long time, most people find it exceedingly difficult to project an alternative. Yet there is nothing unique about education that distinguishes it from the many other human needs which are filled by private enterprise. If for many years the government had undertaken to provide all the citizens with shoes, on the grounds that shoes are an urgent necessity. And if someone were subsequently to propose that this field should be turned over to private enterprise, he would doubtless be told indignantly, what, 
Do you want everyone except the rich to walk around barefoot? But the shoe industry is doing its job with a measurably greater competence than public education is doing its job. To quote Isabel Patterson from God of the Machine once more, quote, The most vindictive resentment may be expected from the pedagogic profession for any suggestion that they should be dislodged from their dictatorial position. It will be expressed mainly in epithets such as reactionary at the mildest. Nevertheless, the question to put to any teacher moved to such indignation is, do you think nobody would willingly entrust his children to you and pay you for teaching them? Why do you have to extort your fees and collect your pupils by compulsion? Close quote. And here is another question commonly asked. Does inherited wealth give some individuals an unfair advantage in a competitive economy? In considering the issue of inherited wealth, one must begin by recognizing that the crucial right involved is not that of the heir, but of the original producer of the wealth. The right of property is the right of use and disposal. Just as the man who produces wealth has the right to use it and dispose of it in his lifetime, so he has the right to choose who shall be its recipient after his death. No one else is entitled to make that choice. It is irrelevant, therefore, in this context to consider the worthiness or unworthiness of any particular heir. His is not the basic right at stake. When people denounce inherited wealth, it is the right of the producer that they, in fact, are attacking. It has been argued that since the heir did not work to produce the wealth, he has no inherent right to it. That is true. The heir's is a derived right. The only primary right is the producer's. But if the future heir has no moral claim to the wealth, except by the producer's choice, neither has anyone else certainly not the government or the public. In a free economy, inherited wealth is not an impediment or a threat to those who do not possess it. Wealth, it is necessary to remember, is not a static, limited quantity that can only be divided or looted. Wealth is produced. Its potential quantity is virtually unlimited. If an heir is worthy of his money, that is, if he uses it productively, he brings more wealth into existence. He raises the general standard of living, and to that extent, he makes the road to the top easier for any talented newcomer. The greater the amount of wealth of industrial development in existence, the higher the economic rewards in wages and profits, and the wider the market for ability for new ideas, products, and services. The less the wealth in existence, the longer and harder the struggle for everyone. In the beginning years of an industrial economy, wages are low. There is little market yet for unusual ability. But with every succeeding generation, as capital accumulation increases, the economic demand for men of ability rises. The existing industrial establishments desperately need such men. They have no choice but to bid ever higher wages for such men's services, and thus to train their own future competitors so that the time required for a talented newcomer to accumulate his own fortune and establish his own business grows continually shorter 
If the heir is not worthy of his money, the only person threatened by it is himself. A free, competitive economy is a constant process of improvement, innovation, progress. It does not tolerate stagnation. If an heir who lacks ability acquires a fortune and a great industrial establishment from his successful father, he will not be able to maintain it for long. He will not be equal to the competition. In a free economy where bureaucrats and legislators would not have the power to sell or grant economic favors, all of the heir's money would not be able to buy him protection for his incompetence. He would have to be good at his work or lose his customers to companies run by men of superior ability. There is nothing as vulnerable as a large, mismanaged company that competes with small, efficient ones. The personal luxuries or drunken parties that the incompetent heir may enjoy on his father's money are of no economic significance. In business, he would not be able to stand in the way of talented competitors or serve as an impediment to men of ability. He would find no automatic security anywhere. At the turn of the century, there was a popular phrase that is very eloquent with regard to this issue. From shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. If a self-made man rose by ability and left his business to unworthy heirs, his grandson went back to the shirt sleeves of obscure employment. He did not, I might add, end up with the governorship of a state. It is a mixed economy, such as the semi-socialist or semi-fascist variety we have today, that protects the non-productive rich by freezing a society on a given level of development, by freezing people into classes and castes and making it increasingly more difficult for men to rise or fall or move from one caste to another, so that whoever inherited a fortune before the freeze can keep it with little fear of competition, like an heir in a feudal society. It is significant how many heirs of great industrial fortunes, the second and third generation millionaires, our welfare statists clamoring for more and more controls. The target and victims of these controls are the men of ability who, in a free economy, would displace these heirs, the men with whom the heirs would be unable to compete. As Ludwig von Mises writes in Human Action, quote, Today, taxes often absorb the greater part of the newcomer's excessive profits. He cannot accumulate capital. He cannot expand his own business. He will never become big business and a match for the vested interests. The old firms do not need to fear his competition. They are sheltered by the tax collector. They may with impunity indulge in routine. It is true the income tax prevents them, too, from accumulating new capital. But what is more important for them is that it prevents the dangerous newcomer from accumulating any capital. They are virtually privileged by the tax system. In this sense, progressive taxation checks economic progress and makes for rigidity. The interventionists complain that big business is getting rigid and bureaucratic and that it is no longer possible for competent newcomers to challenge the vested interests of the old rich families. However, as far as their complaints are justified, they complain about things which are merely the result of their own policies." Close quote. One final question. Is there any validity to the claim that laissez-faire capitalism becomes less practicable as society becomes more complex. This claim is the sort of collectivist bromide that 
so-called liberals repeat ritualistically without any attempt to prove it or substantiate it. To examine it is to perceive its absurdity. The same condition of freedom that is necessary in order to attain a high level of industrial development, a high level of complexity, is necessary in order to keep it. To say that a society has become more complex merely means that more men live in the same geographical area and deal with one another, that they engage in a greater volume of trading and in a greater number and diversity of productive activities. There is nothing in these facts which conceivably could justify the abandonment of economic freedom in favor of government planning. On the contrary, the more complex an economy, the greater the number of choices and decisions that have to be made, and therefore, the more blatantly impracticable it becomes for this process to be taken over by a central government authority. If there are degrees of irrationality, it would be more plausible to imagine that a primitive pre-industrial economy could be managed non-disastrously by the state. But the notion of running a scientific, highly industrialized society with slave labor is barbaric in the ignorance it reveals. Observe that the same type of persons who espouse this doctrine also declare that the underdeveloped nations of the world are not suited for economic freedom, that their primitive level of development makes socialism imperative. Thus, they simultaneously argue that a country should not be permitted freedom because it is too undeveloped economically and that a country should not be permitted freedom because it is too highly developed economically. Both positions are crude rationalizations on the part of statist mentalities who have never grasped what makes industrial civilization possible.